Hi, everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking the Race Before Race Board, um, Shakespeare Center London, and ACMRS and ASU for giving us the opportunity to gather together for this symposium. And especially to Farah, to Ayana, to Ruben, thank you for inviting me to share my work with all of you, um, and to Leah and Terry. Thank you for organizing this and for taking such great care of us. I also wanted to point out that what I'm about to share would not exist without the Race Before Race First Book Institute. Um, so thank you for, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, that community of scholars was really wonderful. And as you can tell, I'm very much indebted to that uh, Race Before Race community. I want to begin by acknowledging that scenes, images, and language analyzed in my presentation today will depict domestic abuse as well as racially and sexually motivated violence. This symposium asks us to think about transcending racial trauma, finding joy through art, scholarship, and community. According to the OED, the earliest usage of the word trauma in the late 17th century defines trauma as a wound on the body from an external cause. Trauma is also the condition caused by a hurt or injury. While the definitions of the term recognize external forces as the cause of trauma, the term itself centers on the personal, the private, the individual, the body. It is often imagined to be a sudden, terrible, potentially isolated event. But trauma does not only affect individuals. As so many indigenous activists have underscored, trauma harms families and communities for generations. And I'm also thinking right now about Lisa's very poignant definition of racial trauma that we just heard. Indeed, there is no denying that the personal is intimate, but the personal, as Sarah Ahmed has underscored, is also structural. In this talk, I'm going to highlight how the perception of trauma as associated with the personal, the private, the individual, the isolated, does the work of shoring up structures that enable privilege and violence committed with impunity. When one Isabel May was asked in 1630 how she knew that Agnes Rowe would not complain publicly to others about the abuses that Agnes suffered at the hands of Isabel's nephew, she responded, quote, we know she would not speak of it, for it was not a matter to be spoken of. Just as Isabel had anticipated, Agnes remained silent for months about the ongoing verbal and physical assaults she had sustained from William Hort in his attempted rape of her person. It was not a matter to be spoken of. The personal trauma that should be kept private, the personal that must be silenced, not only enables perpetrators, but places the onus, the weight and responsibility of that trauma to be carried by the survivor or victim alone. It prevents the recognition of patterns and of resonances. It prevents the recognition of how social structures create the conditions for repeated and not isolated acts of violence. Transcending trauma to me at this point and in my scholarship means finding connections in the archives across class, race, religion, place, and time. It means resisting the view of trauma as singular and unconnected. It means reimagining the histories I have been taught. I find joy in those echoes from disparate artifacts of the past and from reading ideas and questions from other colleagues, scholars, and thinkers like all of you in this room. <laughs> Um, and I like thinking about the ways that the questions that we wrestle over, the problems that I wrestle with in my own projects, are connected with all of you. Joy comes from knowing that I am not alone in this work. So my talk looks at quotidian forms of violence in the domestic space, but it figures the domestic space as a place where multiple structures converge. So let's begin with the legal sphere. The first edition of Michael Dalton's vastly influential legal manual, The Country Justice, explains, quote, though assaults and batteries be for the most part contrary to the peace of the realm, yet some are allowed to have authority over others so that they may, in reasonable and moderate manner only, correct and chastise them for their offenses. So in such cases, the battery maketh no breach of the peace, but the manner of the battery only doth make the breach of the peace. The master, by law, is allowed with moderation to chastise his servant or apprentice. And there we have class Margot. Where are you? There you go. Okay. 
Note here how the legal language explicitly protects authority. The ability to exercise power and to enforce submission is clear, while utilizing a rather ambiguous term that obfuscates the rights of those who are in socially inferior positions. In the 1615 Middlesex Sessions records, moderate and law-abiding battery of a servant was defined as up to six stripes with a birch rod in one disciplinary occasion. By and large, however, the degrees of violence that qualified as appropriate chastisement remained equivocal. The distinct or indistinct, excuse me, and subjective term moderation opened servants to beatings that ran the gamut. And it also reified social hierarchy through the submission of the servant's body to pain and humiliation. Ambiguous gradations of acceptable abuse often allied with the social anticipation of a subject's susceptibility to force. Alice Ashmore, a maid servant charged with bastardy in 1605, had stated that when she resisted her master, he would say to her, quote, thou art my servant and I may do with thee what I please. For at least some masters, conjugal rights extended to the master-servant relationship. This concise and chilling explanation of the master's assumed prerogative to access the body of his maidservant underscores the cultural perception of the permeability of serving women's bodily boundaries rendered precarious due to the authority vested in their masters. The vast majority of 17th century serving women who experienced sexual assault, beatings, and unwanted sexual attention, such as what is depicted in these paintings, rarely sought legal recourse. If we recall, Alice Ashmore was charged with bastardy, the crime of producing an illegitimate child. Her statement concerning the sexual predation of her master, his threats, and her rape exist because a child was born. When working in the archives and perusing materials on sexual violence, one will find very few documents clearly described as rape or even assault. Bastardy depositions provide evidence of the coercive environment of early modern households, and in some cases, of ongoing sexual abuse, such as the experiences of Alice Ashmore. In other words, narratives of trauma have been, for hundreds of years, in the archives labeled, defined, cataloged, as illicit but consensual sex, in which the fault resides in the body of the woman who conceived out of wedlock. Their personal traumas were silenced, and the legal and social blame cast upon the victims. The construction of authority and what it enables, such as the right to beat your servant as a form of chastisement, demands the habituation of certain subjects to psychological abuse and forceful violating touch. Alice Ashmore did not tell her story until charged with bastardy. One must wonder how often serving women experienced unwanted touch and how the repetitive and incessant exposure to all kinds of bodily infringements informed their self-worth and expectations of a legal system comprised of men. The twofold focus of this presentation first draws attention to the Jacobean Theater's orientation of responses to the site of abusive touch. Second, the theatrical techniques of the theater, I argue, enable the expansion of a master's or mistress's authority over the body of a black serving woman, the violence of which is obscured through domestic bonds of generosity and affection and is denied legal recourse. Fletcher's Monsieur Thomas performed sometime between 1614 to 1617 and entered into the Stationer's Register in 1639, features a betric as a punitive form of re-education that goes awry. In true fashion of a city or citizen comedy, the play depicts the dissolute behavior of Londoners and presents parental tyranny as an obstacle to a marriage based on companionship and romantic love. Valerie Traub explains that the 17th century witnessed a shift in the cultivation of domestic heterosexuality in which, quote, erotic desire for a domestic partner, in addition to desire for a reproductive status appropriate mate, became a requirement for, not just a happy byproduct of, the bonds between husband and wife. Protagonists in city comedies, like Monsieur Thomas, conservatively elect a partner they desire whose status and wealth adhere to conventional expectations. After returning from the continent, the libertine Thomas attempts to resume his courtship of Mary with the help of his twin sister, Dorothea, otherwise known as Doll. 
While Mary refuses to wed Thomas until his reformation, his father Sebastian actually encourages Thomas's debauchery and even goes so far as to threaten to disinherit him unless Thomas proves a Lothario. So in other words, the play delineates two alternative routes for Thomas who could either rein in and redirect his erotic energies toward marriage and gain his fair love, but at the cost of economic loss. Alternatively, Thomas could continue his libertine ways and forever lose the opportunity to make Mary his wife. The play curiously opens the possibility that Thomas has not only slept with many women, but may have even raped a young girl when she was 12 years old. And I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A, but for the sake of time, I had to cut it. Um, in other words, even before Thomas attempts to sleep with Mary while she is asleep, um, audiences are already alerted to the ways in which Thomas problematically has a history of describing non-consensual encounters as consensual. Thomas's twin sister, Doll, is best friends with Mary, and the women often enjoy the warmth of their beds together in the same time. Thomas, who is aware of these nightly snuggles between Mary and Doll, designs to gain access to Mary through disguising himself as his twin. Fueled by lust, he plans to capture a defenseless Mary asleep in her bed, blurring the distinction between seduction and rape. He exclaims, quote, full little thinkest thou of thy joy that's coming. Ye delicate coy thief, how I shall thrum ye. Rather than attain her consent, wed her, and then bed her, Thomas endeavors to access Mary's person and plans to treat her as he had those women he encountered on the continent as a mistress rather than a wife. Mary, of course, has anticipated Thomas's scheme and plots a bed trick that she believes will serve to reform him. The bed trick then redirects Thomas's illicit erotic energies away from the purity of his future wife, for as St. Jerome warned in the fourth century, nothing is more impure than to love one's wife as if she were a mistress. Men should appear before their wives, not as lovers, but as husbands. Later in the 16th century, Michel de Montaigne would similarly instruct, marriage is a religious and devout bond, and that is the reason the pleasure man hath of it should be a moderate, staid, and serious pleasure. Through the bed trick, Mary casts the body of Kate, her black servant, as the site for Thomas's carnal, lustful delight, while Mary occupies the place for Thomas's more serious pleasure. As Doll and Mary secretly observe the entertainment of their ploy, Thomas makes his way through the darkness to Mary's bed with the help of an unnamed maid. Unbeknownst to Thomas, Mary's black serving woman, Kate, sleeps soundly in her mistress's stead. So heavy is her sleep that she fails to awaken despite his manhandling of her body to make her lie straighter. Rather than Mistress Mary, Thomas gropes the body of an unconscious Kate. And thus the play, as is customary in the Budrick, deflects the threat of sexual violation onto the body of a black serving woman to protect the white, virtuous, and pure Mary from illicit touch. Throughout the roost, Dahl laughs uncontrollably at the sight of her brother embracing a black woman, a delight which increases in proportion to the heightening of his sexual excitement. Dahl's laughter prompts Mary, though to beckon twice pretty, leave laughing. As is intimated by Mary's attempts to quiet Doll, this trick elicits anxiety, curiosity, and erotic interest in Mary, who wonders, what would he do indeed, Doll? As Doll laughs, Mary's more tempered responses makes possible a variety of interpretations, not least of which could be her combined worry and interest in playing the voyeur as she watches Thomas engage in sexual activity with Kate, either under the assumption that she is Mary or with full knowledge that she is not. It is only after Thomas's discovery of the bed trick that Mary joins Dahl as they parrot Thomas's outburst. The cause of the uproar derives from a combination of Thomas's realization that he has been duped and his racial epithets, oh the devil, oh the devil, that is echoed by Dahl, Mary, and perhaps Plagoras as well. Anthony Bartholomew explains it is Kate's blackness and strongly implied ugliness that move Thomas to horror and the audience presumably to laughter. Although Kate is an obedient servant, Bartholomew notes that she is, quote, as much a butt of the joke as is Thomas. This joke on Thomas relies on the degradation of a black woman. With the discovery of Kate in the bed, Thomas's sexual energy finds release in violence as he beats Kate unrelentingly. On the one hand, since Thomas dons a disguise as doll, the bed trick depicts the quotidian sight of a mistress disciplining her servant. 
On the other hand, their bodies, with hers lying flat on the bed after he had maneuvered her, likely visualized to some degree the titillating image of an English woman or man atop a black serving maid. And here I'm getting my cue to consider the positioning of bodies and their figurative resonances from Arthur Little um, argument regarding the pornographic visual of Othello atop Desdemona as he smothers her. Thomas's injunction that Kate roar again as he mauls her in her, oh, oh, sir maintain the sexual overture of the scene and suggest his erotic satisfaction derived from her screams. After Thomas flees the room, Mary approaches Kate and inquires of her well-being. Kate's response immediately exposes the class differences between the black servant and her mistress. I had a soft bed and I slept out all but his kind farewell. You may bake me now, for all my conscience he has made me venison. Unaccustomed to the comforts of Mary's bed, Kate slept soundly until she received Thomas's blows, which she expresses were so severe as to have caused a change. The beating has made her venison. Venison, a game animal, conveys Thomas's cruelty rather than a measured, a measured and moderate beating. Her change to venison also draws attention to her bruised body. Patricia Akimi has crucially underscored how in Shakespeare's The Comedy of Errors, the bruise functions like a racial marker, as an indelible sign of identity tied to a status of inferiority that signifies one's openness, socially expected susceptibility to abusive touch. Kate's poignant statement that attests to the severity of Thomas's assault on her person takes on another possible significance when the cosmetic techniques of the theater are considered. Prior to the beating, Kate's skin is described as Spanish leather hide, a description that presents her complexion as not belonging within England. It is Spanish, and that's something I will return to later in this talk. Leather hide, furthermore, suggests that her skin is already perceived as that of an animal, and specifically the skin of an animal that has sustained abusive touch. In order to turn the skin of an animal into leather, a person must rigorously scrape flesh and fat from the hide before beginning the tanning process. The deep, dark brown and red of venison as a sign of abuse conflate with the racialized theatrical technique of blackface cosmetics, such that Kate's experiences of pain, injury, and violence are naturalized through artificial theatrical racial markers and rendered as inconsequential. Once again, even before the beating, her complexion is already associated with an animal's flesh that was abusively touched. In other words, her susceptibility to harm is not only evident in her status as a serving maid, but confirmed with the theatrical semiotics that insidiously link one particular racial, racialized sign, skin complexion, with a vulnerability specifically to physical harm. This cultivation of dark complexions as sites of negligible injury undermines the pathos of Kate's expressed pain and even Mary's sympathetic response, alas, poor Kate. The comedy inures playgoers not just to tolerate the sight of a black woman being beaten, but to revel in it. As a form of recompense for the beating Kate sustained, Mary and Doll give Kate a new petticoat and waistcoat. I wish to underscore that these goods emphasize the violent encounter as a sexualized assault. For example, Shakespeare's Jack Cade, the rebel leader, entices his men to action with the following statement. He that will lustily stand to it, which is oftentimes interpreted by critics as both standing up to the enemy as well as having an erection, shall go with me and take up these commodities following item, a gown, a kirtle, a petticoat, and a smock. Here, the temptations of economic gain conflate with women as booty, which foreshadows the rapes that occur later in that play. While the stage used clothing, such as petticoats, as metaphors for women's bodies, 17th century legal depositions often followed similar narratives in sexual assault cases that included the rough treatment of coats, short for petticoats. And there are two examples of which um, are from the cases concerning William Port and John Knight, and I've uh, provided the transcription and underlined um, where it matches on the manuscripts. The gifts given to Kate, therefore, convey the sexualized nature of the altercation while enforcing limits on what her humiliation, physical pain, and trauma are due. Petticoats and waistcoats, which included women's detailed handiwork like embroidery, were not disposable. Women would exercise ownership when they bestowed these personal items onto specific female relatives and maidservants in their wills. In this way, the gifting of these items also symbolized bonds of affection between women. 
This reparative exchange, Kate receives goods for protecting her mistress's body, but at the cost of suffering violent touch from a man who legally does not possess property in her person, a man who is not her master yet, enforces the juridical limits for the battery she had experienced. In other words, her pain receives only a domestic, private, intimate form of justice, one which relies on bonds of affection rather than rights and legal protections by law. Sadia Hartman poignantly draws attention to the cost of such reliance on benevolence when she states that in the patriarchal family from which slave society was based, feelings rather than contract are the necessary corrective to universal despotism. Therefore, duty and reciprocity rather than consent become the basis for equality. Fletcher's play casts Kate's experience of battery as acceptable, as mere ruffling, as a slight disarrangement. A new petticoat will suffice. The benevolence, tenderness, and affection displayed by Mary obscure the brutality of the beating. All is well through the grand generosity of Mary and Dahl, who continue laughing the night away in the bed while a silent and beaten Kate exits the stage. After the bed trick, Mary attempts to make amends with Thomas, who rebuffs her with the following series of threats. Hold yourself contented, for I say I will travel, and so long I will travel till I find a father that I never knew, and a wife that I never looked for, and a state without expectation. So rest, you merry gentlemen. The bed trick was intended to humiliate and thereby tame Thomas. But what we see here is how it actually pushed him to renounce ties to Mary and his father. Thomas declares that he will start a new life far from London. His emphasis on a state without expectation underscores the gamble of his venture, which was tied conceptually to the inevitable hazards of mercantile and colonial pursuits in the Americas and in Asia. Scholars such as Derbert Gosch, Richard Graspie, and David Beavers have written extensively on the substantial reliance on kinship relations in establishing and maintaining networks of foreign commerce between and among factors of the English East India Company and their Southeast Asian partners. Su Feng Ng has shown that English servants of the East India Company would sometimes call their Asian trade partners fathers. And I think that a version of that talk was first given at one of the folder race before a race. Yeah meeting, so there we go, once again, race before race everywhere, which indicates the permeability of racial boundaries in port cities, as well as the role of affective ties in securing economic relations. When Thomas thus threatens that he will travel until he finds a father he never knew, he underscores both that this person will be a stranger unto him, completely unknown, located far from England, but also his certainty that such new bonds of intimacy and identity will be found abroad. The appearance of miscegenation in literary and dramatic works, Kim Paul explains, quote, responds to growing concerns over English national identity and culture as England developed political and economic ties with foreign and racially different nations. This anxiety, Hall further elucidates, was in part due to the recognition that mercantile bonds could lead to other promiscuous exchanges, and did. Monsieur Thomas was performed at a point in the 17th century when factors of the EIC began writing petitions for English women to be sent to Asia to marry with their agents since they were concerned with the growing number of their company's servants engaging in illegitimate liaisons and marriages with local women. Carmen Ocentelli describes the general futility of these petitions. Underlings and notable agents stationed in Japan, the Bay of Bengal, Bombay, and Madras, among others, were known to have developed long-term liaisons and marriages with local Asian and Eurasian women, despite the export of English brides. Letters from between 1613 to 1623 record Englishmen openly requesting gifts for mistresses, wives, and their children, which suggest that, in practice, little stigma existed toward both legitimate and illegitimate families produced by servants of the EIC and local women. However, the official language of the company vacillated between indignant tolerance of a lesser of the two evils, quote, for English soldiers, the hot shots would take liberty otherwise to cool themselves, and blatant censure of such unpalatable unions. Writing from Ahmedabad in 1618, William Biddle reminds the East India Company of an article in its commission that instructs the company to strip Englishmen of their positions and to send them back to England if they were found to have local women as mistresses. Quote, whoever shall have a wife in these parts shall upon knowledge thereof be forthwith dismissed of their place and service and sent home. Indeed, in 1625, 
this scenario did unfold and when John Leachland, a viable factor at Surat, was discovered to ha have been cohabiting with Manya, a woman of that country, with whom he had a child. Although he was cashiered, he was saved from further punishment because the EIC president and council feared that additional discipline would, quote, hasten his marrying to her and so consequently, un so consequently have forsaken his country and friends, or in case of fail thereof, to some other desperate undertaking to his apparent ruin, both which all were willing to prevent, hoping that time will reclaim him and that himself will at last be sensible of his own heirs, being otherwise a man of fair demeanor, sufficient abilities, and clear of accounts with honorable company in India. Leachland was never reclaimed. Later, Peter Mundy in 1632 wrote, Mr. John Leachland, an Englishman, sometime the company's servant, having done prime offices for the love of an Indian woman, refused to return to his country. As these records reveal Leachland's identity as an Englishman and an exceptional agent conflict with what the EIC perceived as an excessive and unnatural attachment to Manya. EIC officials cast interracial marriage as a renunciation of one's loyalty to crown, company, and country, a renunciation of England and of one's fellow Englishmen. Thus, when Fletcher's ploy, play has Thomas threatened that he will find a wife he has yet to desire, a wife I never looked for. The comedy draws upon the known temptations of mercantile ventures, as well as the reality that some Englishmen, including the most esteemed, virtuous, and fair, settled abroad permanently and would, of their own volition, choose to sever ties with their homeland in favor of foreign places and people. The pervasive practice of European cohabitation with local women in Southeast Asia explains the urgencies that necessitated such expressed opposition from EIC headquarters that was echoed on London stages and pages. Richard Head's sensational and satirical prose fiction, The English Rogue, published in 1665, would describe the adventures of Meriton Latrune, who seduced by wealth, eventually condescends to marry with, quote, an Indian black, despite his initial overwhelming disgust in her appearance, quote, I persuaded myself to marry her and gained so much conquest over myself that I could kiss her without disgorging myself. Just like Thomas's reaction to the sight of Kate's black body in her mistress's bed, in the English rogue, what is most revolting, at least what is presented as being most revolting about this Indian infidel, succubus, and devil, is her dark complexion. She, quote, is a thing all black, burnt to a coal. The woman, in fact, acknowledges this when she is instructed, if my complexion do not please thy mind, then close thine eyes, yet love, this love is blind. The repetition of myself, persuaded myself, conquest over myself, without disgorging myself, opens the possibility for readers to feel with and through Meriton. Rather than dissociate readers from Meriton, the term myself encourages them to internalize and embody his emotions of disgust. What Fletcher's black serving woman Kate and Head's Indian black reveal is, in the words of Matthew Chapman, quote, a continuum of anti-black thought in the English psyche, which, as you can see here, is deployed in a global early modernity. It is therefore telling that what convinces the titular character of John Fletcher's Monsieur Thomas to stay, to remain in England among his family and friends, is the virtuous and exceedingly fair Mary, who vows to do more than kiss once they are lawfully wedded. The promise of a heterosexual union with an English woman of his same class serves as a bulwark to Thomas's waywardness and propensity for travel. I'd like to end this talk by troubling the neat conclusion that the genre of comedy seems to produce in the marriage of Thomas and Mary. Specifically, I wish to draw our attention to the character who pays the price for the reproductive futurity of whiteness premised on the emergence of the fair and legitimate English couple as they clasp hands to the cheers and applause of audiences. Let us return to Thomas's assault on Kate's person. When he discovers the bed trick, Thomas portrays himself as the victim and does so through a stereotypical invocation of blackness as evil and inhuman, quote, I am abused most damnedly, most beastly. However, this exclamation that presents himself as a victim quickly takes a curious turn when he muses, yet if it be a she-devil, but the house is up and here's no staying longer in this cassock. From offense and repugnance, Thomas's tone changes as he desires to take advantage of Mary's trick. He momentarily considers some sexual engagement with the sleeping Kate, despite the fact that she is not his beloved Mary, nor awake. 
I'm especially concerned with his assumed access to the body of an unconscious Kate. As a maidservant, Kate would be susceptible to predatory masters who may claim, as we've heard before, thou art my servant, and I may do with thee what I please. Kate, moreover, is doubly disenfranchised in her blackness due to the representation on the stage and on the page of what blackness is supposed to symbolize. She is, according to Thomas, a she-devil, terms that signify sin, promiscuity, and inordinate lustfulness. Recall the Indian black succubus from the English rogue, whose voracious sexuality turns her into the aggressor, who feeds on white men, or the poem attributed to Henry Reynolds in which a black woman pursues a fair youth. Stay, lovely boy, why fliest thou me that languish in these flames for thee? Kate's black skin, which to some early moderns could have been read as a predisposition toward lustfulness, may have, therefore, signified a presumed willingness to engage in sex, and therefore an unintending incapability to say no. Thomas never actualizes his fantasy, but it is worth considering the extent to which Kate's consent would have mattered had members of the household been asleep. Although Thomas is not Kate's master, nor is she temporarily his servant, he beats her in a location he has no authority over and is allowed to leave the room at his leisure. Mary, Doll, and the unnamed maids never interrupt the blows that fall on the defenseless Kate. They laugh. Kate is not beaten for a disobedience that she had enacted. She did exactly as she was told to do. She was beaten for her complexion and for the ridicule, therefore, assigned to Thomas through the placement of her body in that bed as instructed by her mistress. Humiliated, Thomas disclaims Mary, Kate's mistress, and enacts his renunciation through the beating of her black servant, Mary's servant, a person under Mary's protection and authority. I see this as a moment of instruction for the English regarding the exploitation of and the physical and sexual access to the black servants who comprise their households. When Thomas beats Kate, he reasserts the expected gender hierarchy of the early modern household that is momentarily inverted when Mary schools him, so to speak, with her ploy. As Naomi Nadaya underscores, Quote, while there was no such thing as a regulated slave trade in Tudor England, Afro-diasporic people who had been smuggled into the country found themselves in a legal limbo, vulnerable to the whims of their clandestine buyers. Gustav Unger estimates that the Afro-diasporic people comprise around 0.5% of Londoners at this time, and most served as domestic servants. The work of MTS Habib reveals that while Elizabeth's reign marked a radical increase in the numbers of black people in England, Afro-British people were part of England even before Elizabeth's accession in 1558 due to her grandfather's and father's foreign initiatives, as well as those of the Scottish King James IV. In other words, by the time Monsieur Thomas was being performed, there were already third or fourth generation black men, women, and children born in the realm. Quote, the Africans that lived in towns of rural communities in early modern England, Unyeka Nubea points out, resided with English men and women. Many of them would have considered themselves members of local communities. Although Mary's servant is described as having Spanish leather hide for skin, she is also called Kate. She bears an English name, one of the top 10 names given to English daughters in the 17th century. Kate, unlike other serving women in the play, is named. The bed trick demonstrates that the bonds of intimacy she shares with her mistress require Kate's vulnerability, as well as Mary's complicity in the expansion of patriarchal authority for Mary to accrue privileges. When Mary gives her consent to wed Thomas, she submits to him, making him lord of her goods and master of her servants. Audiences have already witnessed the liberties Thomas takes without yet occupying that position of power. More importantly, we have seen the abuses that Mary permits and her strategy for negotiating her future spouse's physical and sexual aggressions. What then can we suppose happens to Kate when the house is quiet and asleep? He has made me venison. Kate draws our attention to her mauled body, but she also indicates another kind of bruise, one that shapes how she perceives herself. She is transformed. This change indicates her understanding of the kind of treatment she is likely to receive in the future. And it is this bruise that is not so easily seen as a somatic mark, but one that is evident nonetheless in her silence as she exits the stage.
Hello. Oh, we have time for some questions. So, Ayana. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsten, that was amazing, so good. Um, I'm wondering if you're familiar with some new work by um, Lily Freeman-Jones and Juan Chuan Ko about skin coats, um, the use of skin coats in performance. They were actually coats made of, of leather that, that m mimicked other racial features. Yeah. So I wonder if her Spanish leather is actually a skin coat and then when she jokes that i've been made venison it's a the, it's referring to the leather again yeah. it's not to detract from all the amazing um kind of analysis and argumentation you're making but i do wonder if it's a meta theatrical moment there and it is i mean i, mean, I think that um kimberly point heaven also points to this that the working of these theatrical semiotics on the stage in particular in relation to um cosmetics that it is, there, on the one hand, it naturalizes, right? The idea is to try to naturalize either um, perhaps superiority tied to whiteness or um, inferiority tied to blackness. But it's doing this while at the same time making it very hyper aware that this is being constructed. And so I think that that argument, especially regarding the Spanish leather hide, makes me wonder then if they are literally wearing leather on their skin, then I think that all the more reason why that argument, oh, he has made me venison, doesn't really necessarily elicit the kind of sympathy because of the fact that their skin is already made out of leather. And it makes me think about the ways that, I mean, we have this today in which ideas of certain bodies being more susceptible, um, and maybe being able to withstand violence, right? How that continues to negatively impact women, for example, back women in hospitals and childbirth that could in some ways be due to already these hundreds of years of viewing certain people and their bodies because of their complexion as more adept to withstand abuse, right? Leather, after all, is stronger than, yeah. yeah. Just to add on to what you're saying, but also a theatrical beating of a young boy performing a black Hardly. woman in a leather hide, you could actually beat them harder because it's sort of a protection for the beating. Just all to, oh goodness, you're on yeah. the right track, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ayanna. Hi, Corey. Hi, Kirsten. It's been so amazing to watch this work um, grow and develop, so thank you for that opportunity and for this talk. Um, I wanted to ask if you might say a bit more about the possibilities of moving from the leather covering to <laughs> venison. Precisely because venison, to me, uh, there's a shift to the interior that's going on here. Venison is not only the act of, of killing, but it's also then consuming. It's made for consumption and then for, mm, what's the word, for integration into the body of the consumer, right? So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how that shift may be operating with regard to Kate's positionality, vis-a-vis -vis the you know, positionality of Thomas, the positionality of Mary, but especially what that may be saying about, you know, what the text wants us to take away from Kate's transformation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gord. I mean, what you have um, so generously made me think about is the way that Kate is being framed within that household because more than likely she will follow into the household that now her master is going to be Thomas, right? And the position of Kate in between Mary and, and Thomas is one in which she is to be used, right? Um, for, for their benefit, for their pleasure. And there was another aspect of venison that made me consider, and that is sort of the communal role of sort of like preparing that meat, and the communal role of banquets, right, and the community of the theater. There's something about um, both the communal preparing of that, of, the, of venison, but also the communal consumption of it, right, that I think parallels nicely, and I can't quite um, describe it now, but I think that there's something really interesting that you're making me consider, which is that communal element of the theater in their laughter toward the beating of, of Kate, right, alongside the way in which venison itself is being prepared, is being consumed within a community. Yeah. 
Just, just to piggyback, to what extent do you think she's being used to make them whole? From a lack that they have, yeah. Well, to make them whole and also in very disparate pleasures. So one of the ways that this project is also sort of shifting as well is to think about um, the ways that Mary and Doll, right? So Mary's attraction to Thomas might very well be because her twin, I mean his twin, is Doll, right? And so perhaps in some ways her ability to be whole requires right, Kate's body within that domestic sphere. And to think that and to remember that within the domestic sphere that is the predominant role that many people of Afro-diasporic right, peoples within London would have served. So my point is that what is happening on that stage is not aberrant, right, that they're actually thinking through how do we negotiate our desire to go abroad, right? How does Thomas get the whole, the fulfillment of his pleasure? He wants to go abroad. He's going to stay within the domestic sphere. And I don't necessarily buy the argument that it's just because of the white heterosexual futurity, right? I think that there's something else going on and in terms of the ways that the erotics are being negotiated and different kinds of erotics, right? Mary and Doll, and you also have Thomas and, and Kate. And so I'm thinking about that um, within sort of the framework of London that thanks to the work of other scholars has opened my mind too. So thank you, Corey. I'm the last question. <laughs> That's scary. Um, listening to just this discussion and picking up on this, there's something incredibly voyeuristic. You use the term erotic. Mm -hmm. um, you're kind of dancing around it in yeah. terms of this. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could think about this play as representing a very problematic erotic performance mm -hmm. in terms of consent, mm -hmm. both implied and expected. That is, Kate is expected mm -hmm. to consent, mm -hmm. but she cannot because she's unconscious. So thinking about that, the, like I said, the voyeuristic quality to it, which turns this whole situation into a perverted polyamory mm -hmm. representation. Um, thoughts? Absolutely. I'm sorry to bring smut to the conversation, but thoughts? No, no, no. absolutely. Um, yes, it, it, and that is one of the primary threads of this, of this chapter in terms of its argument, is pointing to the problematic ways in which Kate is being understood to be a member within this household, right? It is required for her to embody that vulnerability, to be vulnerable, and to consent to that vulnerability. And actually, I really want to qualify the way in which, because it's not consent, because it, part of what this piece is trying to point to is that her consent is assumed. And therefore, if you can't, to use Wendy Hyman, right, if you cannot say no, Right? If your no has no force, then neither does your yes. Right? And that's a really horrible way of paraphrasing, Wendy. But, um, but that, is, you know, that, that is part of this work, is trying to point to the ways that um, Kate's existence within that household is presupposing, whether it be because of the ways that people are understanding um, black women and sexuality, or also her relationship to her mistress. And in other words, her position within the household is to deflect his violence, right? Her body becomes that space. Remember, the place for the, the early modern wife, right, should be a state of moderate pleasure. So yes, pleasure now is starting heterosexual, like, like that, that desire is there, but so is now too an understanding of, well, what do we do with these multiple bodies within our household, right? And whose pleasure can be um, supported, whose pleasure is at the expense of others. Um, and that's, that's what this work is doing. So thank you, Margo. All right.